Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, happy Friday, March 19th. Um, hopefully you guys had a great week. It's one o'clock in the afternoon and you've joined us for the CAF COVID weekly roundup. Uh, we'd like to get these uh, started right on uh, time. Um, today, we're gonna start uh, with the discussion on the AFLs that came out this week. We'll also do a little uh, clarification on 22, uh, AFL 20-22.6, uh, there were some changes to that where they didn't update the the number of the AFL, but they did change some language inside the AFL, and we'll cover that. We also will cover the quarantine guidance, and even though um, AFL 21-08 hasn't been updated, we'll cover what we uh, know is going to be the update and uh, uh, Dr. Epson answered some questions on the call yesterday that we've captured and uh, we'll go over that. And then we're gonna talk about after action reporting or the after action review process that contributes to an after action report and an improvement plan. My name's Jason Belden. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness for CAF and uh, uh, Patty's on another meeting today and I'm gonna try to get through the AFLs. Um, we, I'll, I'll give you a little clarification on one of the AFLs because we're gonna do a little deeper dive in a couple weeks on the uh, staffing audit AFL, but we'll get to that in a second. So I wanna say thank you guys for uh, joining us again. Uh, I know we're a week or a year into these things and we're going to, we had originally talked about um, uh, cutting back the uh, the frequency in which we do these um, uh, webinars. But in the, uh, given we had anticipated in March, we would be getting, we would have more direction in terms of wrapping up mitigation plans, uh, converting back to normal survey process. And I don't think that's happening as rapidly as we expected. And so we're gonna keep these webinars through at least April um, to make sure that we don't miss anything. You know, if we if we have a webinar and it it only has to be 15 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, that's fine. But we just want to keep these on the calendar, uh, so we're going to con continue these through April at least. Um, and then I know the folks at at Eight Thag are going to continue their webinars uh, probably quite a bit further than that. All right, so let's get to our uh, traditional introduction. Um, the speakers' opinions expressed are their own and they may not reflect CAF's official position. Uh, these webinars are brought to you as a part of a grant-funded program uh, through ASPR, the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response Hospital Preparedness Program. And uh, you'll see why that's important in a second here, because we're gonna talk about uh, tools that are developed through that program for after-action reporting. Uh, I have no financial conflicts, and I'll be the only speaker on uh, this webinar, unless Patty uh, hops in in the middle. Uh, the intent of the webinars is to give you a situational report uh, for the past week, as well as forecasting and best practices uh, where we can identify those. And so we'll hop right into the first AFL, which is the AFL 20-38.6. Um, and the link is on the, the fourth bullet point there. Um, this visitor limitation guidance is for all facilities, but if you're a skilled nursing facility, you should refer to 22.6 um, for your specific guidance. There is some uh, some elements of this particular AFL that apply uh, to all facilities, meaning ICF, SNFs, uh, hospitals, clinics, everybody. Um, but for the most part, if you're a SNF, you're going to follow the 22.6. 20, um, if you're an ICF, uh, intermediate care facility, um, you're gonna need to follow uh, this AFL to set the frequency based on the color identified within the AFL. And then you're gonna follow the QSO from CMS 21-14, which talks about all of the infection prevention measures uh, that you're required to do. Uh, now, as you read that guidance in the QSO, it's very, very similar to the skilled nursing facility guidance. And so um, you'll, you'll uh, get some of that. Um, it, it, I, you know, there's not huge differences for that, but I will say that in the QSO, it does not tie any of these uh, measures to uh, vaccination um, of the uh, client slash resident, and it does not tie anything into vaccination of the visitors. 
Um, and, and I saw pa Patty hopped on, so this is fantastic. I did. <laughs> uh, so Patty, I had, when we looked at this, uh, the 20 or the 38.6 for the visitor limitation, did you see anything else that that the skilled nursing facilities would have to carve out of that? Um, no, they. Um, it really looked like they only added in the surgeries. Um, um, so there was very little additions, anything that would impact skilled nursing facilities other than following their the other guidance. Um, yeah. yeah. And the, the information they put further down in the AFL that said for specific uh, resident slash patient populations, there were uh, specific guidance. And the one that I, I took out of the AFL, and uh, and we're assuming this applies to, um, Patty, would it be safe to assume this applies to the ICFs or, or no? Which Is number? This, well, if you look on the 38.6 on the on the bottom, it says patients with physical, uh, uh, intellectual, developmental disabilities, and patients with cognitive impairments. Now, is this specific to those patients in a hospital that fall in this category, or is this patients all settings? All settings. So this would apply for the um, any long-term care facility, correct? These, correct. This, uh, these that one is parts. is addressed to all facilities. So it, 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 it doesn't specifically carve out in there um, for that topic, a specific facility type to do that. So it would be for all, any facility for those categories. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Thank okay. you. Little, yeah, yeah, no, I was a little confused on that, but that, that uh, does make sense. It does confuse things a little bit for you guys as SNFs when you look at, you know, What's the difference between a patient with a cognitive impairment versus something uh, uh, with compassionate care that qualifies under the expanded dish definition of compassionate care? I think um, what's what's clear here is they want you to be able to uh, identify two support persons um, for these folks, and that's really the main uh, the difference here. So yeah, and while you're working on it, with you know, reach out with your district office. Each district office we want to make sure is interpreting these um, AFLs um, the same way as every other district office, of course. So it's always really a good idea to review that and say this is our interpretation in our facility and make sure that's the interpretation of the district office. And if it's the district office's interpretation is really, you know, out there or something, please let CAF know so we can make sure that their interpretation is as intended from the um, Sacramento headquarters CDPH so that, um, all district offices are interpreting it. Um, the, the same. Yeah, and that's perfect. And and uh, well, I'll I'll mention this when we get to the uh, the clarifications on the twenty twenty two point six. But we definitely know that uh, I want to talk to you about the local health departments as well because they they have they it what seems uh, apparent is most of them are gonna have uh, uh, slight differences from visitation, or at least some of them have, and we'll, we'll cover that in a second. So in terms of the AFL 21-11, um, this uh, AFL is regarding the guidelines for 3.5 uh, direct care service hours uh, for the staffing audits. Um, it supersedes an AFL from 2016, um, and the bullet points you see here. 19, Jason, I'm going to correct you. It's from 2019. 19. It's AFL 1916. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from okay. 2019. Sorry. And and the bullet points here are the uh, highlights from that uh, particular AFL. And and Patty's going to do. Uh, we're going. Well, CAF is going to do a deeper dive on this AFL. But I will say for. You know, generally we wouldn't cover a, an AFL that relates to normal everyday um, uh, stuff on this particular webinar but since there's an entire new section added specifically for information from the pandemic uh, i thought it'd be appropriate to bring it up here so that you could see what information you're going to need to to capture uh, to be able to use it for your staffing audits and so the things um and there's a link to the the bottom there uh, the webinar or the the AFL has this uh, expanded section. It's really long, so uh, I'll I'll try to just give you the highlights here, and then and then I'll let you know kind of how uh, CAF is going to provide some education around it. So 
they ex they added this uh, kind of section where it says audit considerations during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the required documentation that you're gonna be required to have is each one of these uh, uh, bullet points. Um, if you've used emergency staffing, you're gonna need to have a copy of that, the initial request that you sent over. Um, if you received an emergency staffing approval letter, from an authorized agency. And I've, I've talked to folks and I know that if you ordered uh, staff through the MOAC program, you did not automatically receive an emergency staffing approval letter. Um, and that was one of the things that they identified. So uh, we'll, we'll have to work on getting that, you know, some other way around that because that's not a standard thing that they've been uh, sending out. But the other things you'll need is, you know, basics, employee names, start and stop dates, actual direct care service uh, by employee, employee numbers, payroll codes, all that good stuff. And then it went on to state that any SNF with a 5000 a waiver for uh, nursing assistants to work as temporary CNAs, any one of those nursing assistants who have not completed the training program shall only re render services as a competency level confirmed. Um, and uh, any SNF with this approved waiver will need to provide documentation to the auditors. And that's the important part. This is information that you're collecting during your, your response to the pandemic that you're gonna need to carve out and keep that for your staffing audit. So I wanted to make you guys aware of that so you can prepare and keep that information right now. And then uh, because this, this AFL is so dense and uh, there's so many portions to this that uh, Patty brought up a, a good point that we should do a little deeper dive into the audit, um, the staffing audit consideration. So we're going to try to use this webinar, um, not next Friday, but the following Friday to cover staffing audits. Uh, and, and Patty will, uh, we'll try to get some uh, Mark Reagan well, on well, here. The folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're going to try to get Mark Reagan on and Jeff and Jennifer um, with CAF on this webinar, but we're right now we're looking if that date and time will work for everyone, given it's the Friday before Easter weekend. Um, we're not sure who has, you know, the time of time availability and all that, but we're going to try to, regard, regardless, we will definitely be posting um, the date and time. We'll make sure everyone knows when it is. We're going to try to take the time slot already existing for that Friday. Um, but we definitely will get the message out to everyone. There's a lot of nuances in this AFL. They're going to have a big impact on providers. Um, and so Mark Reagan's going to cover them and, and, and myself and um, any other CAF team member that feels um, th the changes um, affect their particular expertise. So we're, we're going to pull that together, get some education out real quick for everyone. Now it goes back starting for the auditing period, July 1st, 20. 20 forward so you're going to have to go back and look at all your staffing from last year july 1st forward your daily sheets and you're going to have to make sure all these changes and all these little specifics are are there and the biggest one like jason's probably going to be covering is is a lot to do with this emergency stuff but there's a lot of other nuances that we're going to cover that are going to have a big impact other than what the covid 19 um, information so stay tuned for that yeah Thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. I appreciate that. This is way out, out of my depth here, guys, and, and I'm, I'm very thankful to have Patty uh, help explain that stuff. So. All right, let's get to the uh, clarifications I want to cover on the AFL 2022.6. And I know there were a lot of questions uh, after our webinar last week, and I will get to those at the end here. And I want to encourage folks to, um, uh, if you have questions now, please put them into the uh, question box and we'll get them. Um, uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. There was a change in the AFL, in in the language of the AFL. Now, they did not change the, the AFL number, um, but many of you guys had uh, really honed in on uh, a statement within the AFL that uh, said, in addition to maximizing visitation opportunities, keep residents and families connected, facilities must, and they changed that must language to should. And so um, those are the, the four bullet points they had on uh, communication, on having a, uh, like an app or a, a recorded phone line or things like that. And I just want you to know that uh, they changed the language in the AFL. They didn't, they didn't make any noise about it, but it did 
I, I looked at the previous version and the current version and they changed the language to say should. Uh, so they removed that must. Um, and after listening to Heidi kind of give a description, uh, it sounds like their expectation is one of the one of those methods you should be employing. Um, and I, I don't think uh, folks are not doing that. I think it was more of a, a question of, do we have to do all four of them? And as long as it sounds like, if, as long as you're doing one of the four, you're gonna be fine uh, uh, from a survey perspective. Um, they went on to clarify or, or tried to clarify uh, the reporting of testing for visitors done with a point of care device. And while I understand that licensing has no requirement to uh, to have you report to them, uh, there's another division within public health that has to do with uh, lab reporting. And they, these are considered laboratory equipment. And to use them, you need to have a CLIA waiver and you need to report uh, all tests. And that's a state law that has not been waived. Um, the problem is licensing does not oversee that department. And so when Heidi made that statement, uh, it's true for licensing, they don't have that requirement, but um, uh, but CalReady definitely does have that requirement. So what can you do if you want to use the point of care device? Now, if you're already using the point of care device and you're comfortable with your reporting process, continue to do that. You don't have to make any changes. If you want to convert to using the point of care devices, and you've already received it and you have your CLIA waiver, um, there's a, a, a guidance document there that tells you, you know, kind of how to use it. And then there's, tells you where you should be reporting uh, these uh, tests. Now, I will say that I've, I've talked to a few counties that have kind of said, go ahead and use them and report to us positives. But that's not, a, that doesn't apply universally. And it's, it's not consistent with what the state law is. So I can't, I can't tell you to not do that because it's an actual law. I know, uh, you know, Heidi's uh, said that, that you don't have to, but I really, uh, I just don't want to get folks in trouble. And I'll know, I know that Dr. Foote, the other physician that's on those calls from the, that gives the testing reports also has the same concerns that I do. And so I, my um, my suggestion is if you've already incorporated the point of care testing, continue to use it in the manner, uh, you know, as long as it's consistent with the guidance. Um, and if you've not already set up that process, um, you know, the, with the visitors testing negative, um, you know, you're just going to have to have them take that PCR test. Now that now that visitor restriction is only applies to the purple um, counties for indoor in-room visitation. So we're really talking about a lim limited subset of potential visitors, but I don't want you guys to get into this thing where you um, you use one of those point of care testing devices and somewhere down the road, somebody's gonna hit you in an audit for not reporting it, so. And I wanna cover um, a revision to Los Angeles County. So Los Angeles County had uh, taken a more, um, a stricter stance in an email that they sent out to all the providers last Friday. Last Friday afternoon, after this webinar, they had their own webinar where they removed that, that restriction. And I, I just wanna show one where you can get a copy of that webinar um, and slides. So the slide deck is available there, um, as well as a recorded version of that webinar. So if you're in Los Angeles County, I highly recommend watching that because it gives Los Angeles County specific information that was a slightly different than what we reviewed on the webinar last week. Now they have not, um, well, I didn't, I haven't checked this morning, but as of last night, they have not updated the public health website in LA County to, to show the new visitation guidance. It still shows the old one. So in the interim, what I've done is I've taken the information right from the web or right from the slide deck uh, to be able to give you uh, that bullet point there. So in terms of, um, we're talking about, uh, you know, the visitors needing uh, uh, to have a test. They revised that and said, when the county is in tiers, uh, you know, two, three or four, consider asking visitors to test negative or a viral test uh, uh, less than two days prior to the visit, especially if the visitation is indoors 
or if the resident is unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. And so that's quite a bit different than requiring the visitor to test. And so I wanna let folks know that that did not make it into their um, uh, final um, recommendation. If it does hit the, um, the website or their guidance documents, I will obviously uh, address that here uh, when I see it. All right, let's go on to AFL 21-08.1. We had originally anticipated that uh, we were going to be talking about 2108.2, um, but that has not been uh, updated yet. But I will, I, I want to give you the information that I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that is going to be on the AFL. And the reason being is as they put it into writing in terms of the notes for the webinar uh, that was held on Wednesday. And so I'm going to read. Uh, some of those, um, some of the recommendations, um, and because this is what we know is going to be in the AFL. So, for fully vaccinated healthcare professionals with high risk exposures who are asymptomatic, do not need to be restricted from work for 14 days following their exposure. Uh, and work restrictions will still apply for fully vaccinated healthcare professionals if they have underlying immunocompromising conditions. Um, and there's more, they, they expand that definition of immunocompromising conditions, um, but that kind of gives you, uh, you know, if, if they don't have any of the immunocompromising conditions, they don't, they're not a part of that uh, restriction, that work restriction. And then uh, obviously the link to the change there is highlighted where it says CDC change. Um, they did go on to say that healthcare professionals who've traveled should continue to follow the travel uh, recommendations and requirements, including restrictions from work. That's going to be in the AFL. And the blue link there takes you to those recommendations and requirements. Um, they go on to state that fully vaccinated inpatients and residents in healthcare settings should continue to quarantine following prolonged close contact. That's consistent with what Dr. Epson said on Wednesday. So we think that's gonna make it into the AFL. And quarantine is no longer recommended for residents who are being admitted to post-acute care facility if they are fully vaccinated. And we imagine that's going to get added to the AFL, but they're gonna put a little caveat uh, in there in terms of making sure that the resident is not coming from a facility that's in an outbreak or, or things like that. There's gonna be some small changes to that particular uh, thing based on the conversation that Dr. Epson had, um, but those are all, you know, trending in the right direction for us to um, minimize the impact to operations if we get a positive test. Um, so I want to hop to um, after action reporting and improvement planning. Well, before I do that, uh, Patty, do you have any anything else you wanted to add on 2108? I know we've gotten a bunch of questions from folks about this. Uh, and I'm certain, I haven't looked at the questions yet. I'm sure there's going to be more, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's just, you've covered it and um, the fact that it's going to be changing. So um, it's, I think it's just important to know which one you're following. You have to follow the one that is actually the mo the, the one that's released until the, the, the revision is re um, released. And um, which is going to cause, you know, again, it's about paper trail documentation and policy updates, what actions you took and when, and being able to, um, in the future, um, be able to demonstrate um, what what you were doing and when. And um, with all of these revisions for all of these AFLs, it's going to be a tracking nightmare for, um, especially um, when they come in and do your surveys or they look at your infection control stuff. So um, it's just it's just going to be a lot of fun as far as you know trying to remember what was in place and when. And it's going to um, that's what CAP is here for. So we are definitely tracking and keeping track of which guidance came out and when and if you need any of that um, you can always reach out to us so um, to help you during any of your survey um, any of your look back on any of this yeah perfect thank you patty and that that's going to take us right into the the next section but, but before we want to jump to that i had forgotten to mention that I, and i wanted to talk about this in relation to both uh, afl 21-08 and afl 20-22.6 the both of those AFLs are kind of state level guidance. And we have seen uh, on the visitation side, we've already seen a number of counties uh, add on to uh, the recommendations from the state. San Diego, San Mateo, Los Angeles, 
those are just the counties I know of for certain have uh, county specific information. And I imagine when this um, when this AFL comes out, we could see a local health department variation too, especially as it relates to uh, quarantine or after exposure. Um, uh, folks may not feel comfortable with that, and and certainly the local health departments can make um, uh, a little more stringent uh, guidelines based on what they think is best in their community. So, uh, if you're, you know, please for both the visitation and then when the quarantine comes out, you're going to have to you know, really clarify with your local health department to make sure that they're um, they're in lockstep or in um, agreement with CDPH's guidance. All right, so, um, so Patty talked about, you know, kind of timelining things out, and that's a great, a great segue into after action reporting and improvement planning. And for folks that have never been in a, a disaster before, or if, um, You've only done, uh, you know, small exercises before. A real big portion of how we um, how we get better um, uh, in disasters is through after action review and reporting, and improvement planning. And um, the American Healthcare Association has uh, developed a template. Um, it's still in draft, and and I'm going to show you a copy of that in in a second. I've included a blank version, which I've I've kind of started the process and I'll show you where it, where it's different from the ACA template. And the reason why is AHCA is going to try to do as much of the work as possible, meaning we're going to try to do the analysis of core capabilities and give you some standard language. But we're going to start seeing surveys uh, starting pretty soon, and we may not have this completed by the time you get your survey, and that surveyor is asking for your exercise material from 2020. And so I wanted to get this uh, to you so that if you wanted to get started, we're going to show you how to fill it out, uh, what you know, what core capabilities to use, how, what objectives to use, and then kind of you know how to get through that process. So. Um, the core capabilities, these things uh, that are defined, come from the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response Hospital Preparedness Program. And CAF's uh, disaster program is a, a downstream impact of that. So that, this is this big national program that pays hospitals uh, and the health systems really to develop preparedness. Um, they've developed all of these tools that, that are used um, you know, throughout disasters. That hospital preparedness program is what pays for the grant at CDPH that pays, uh, you know, for this particular program. And so we utilize the tools developed by this program to help guide us in the after action reporting process. So in the, the federal government's four capabilities, um, they have a bunch of objectives within these capabilities, but it's really four capabilities that are identified as a nation. Um, uh, the capability one, a foundation for healthcare and medical readiness. Uh, capability two is healthcare and medical response coordination. Capability three is continuity. And capability four is medical surge. And so as we go through uh, any kind of disaster, all of our actions are really going to be contained within those four kind of buckets. And there's there's a fifth bu uh, bucket that's probably going to get added after this in terms of be behavioral health. Uh, and addressing behavioral health needs of, of both our resident population, but our specifically our staff population uh, afterwards. But in terms of the response, we're, we're going to talk about uh, finding objectives within these four capabilities. Um, if you look at the handouts, and I don't want to overwhelm you with the handouts. Hey, um, Jamie, can can you uh, let me share my screen? So I'm I want to show folks a, a copy of what I'm looking at without without having them to pull this 70 page document up and, and take a look at it. All right, give me one second here, guys. And Jamie, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, looks good. Okay, perfect, thanks. And uh, one second here, guys. So as we look at this, um, after action, after action report. I'm going to show you 
where how we kind of fill these out and where these capabilities go and then i'll show you where to find the uh, capabilities so this is uh, is the handout here um, essentially what you do is you know put it on your letterhead um you know, date it um we pre-filled all the information in terms of the dates now the dates we're going to look at this after action reporting process is from uh, March uh, through the inception or the uh, declaration of the pandemic through the end of 2020 calendar year. Um, here are three kind of uh, general basic bullet points that we set out to do as um, as an industry or a profession. Um, you know, we activated our facility command centers. We reported to our local healthcare coalitions or departments of health about our operational status, uh, how many beds we had available, what was our supplies. Um, and then we also manage scarce resources and staff and PPE and requesting emergency assets as needed. So all these things, uh, we pre-fill um, you know, that information for you. Uh, and then where it says this, this kind of capabilities listed, this is what we're going to reference and it's in your handout here. So as we look at this, giant document. I, I just want to show you guys under each capability. So on that first capability where I said foundation of healthcare and medical readiness, it has objectives that you may or may not have prioritized at the beginning of this uh, response. And so I'll, I'll just give you an example. Here is one I would highly recommend that you having highlighted is um, identifying risks and needs. And so did you you know did you have an uh, objective during the um during the response for you to identify risks and address those as they came and and that activity kind of a the language behind um or the the naming of that particular particular type of activity would be uh figuring out where your resource gaps are and mitigation strategies and so that so in terms of you know how you look at uh, filling this out when we look at this we say here are the associated objectives so for capability one under foundation of healthcare and medical readiness we're going to add an objective we're going to pick one of those objectives under that capability and add the activity from the list that we want to talk about now as we um as we go through this um i'm sorry jamie can you go back to the presentation Perfect, thank you. So as we go through this, almost every objective that you can think of during a response, uh, along with activities, are gonna be listed out there. Now, the way to read this giant document, um, these documents are written for healthcare coalitions at large, meaning they're, they're, you're gonna see stuff in there that has nothing to do with uh, individual healthcare facilities. They have to do with you know, communities working together and things like that. What we wanna do is we wanna take those buckets of uh, activities and apply that to are those activities that we use. So in an example where we looked at that one activity, uh, that said um, prioritize resource gaps and mitigation strategies that that um, when you read the preamble or the the description of that particular activity it might not line up necessarily with what you uh, particularly did and that's okay we just want to make sure that we keep the same kind of uh, nomenclature or language to be able to, you know, kind of tie things back together. So we're all talking about the same stuff. Um, now, what when you pick your uh, objectives, um, you're going to place them under the capability in which uh, it aligns. Um, and some of those, uh, you know, kind of typical activities that we're going to are going to be in there, are identifying the risk and addressing the needs. Uh, coordinating your response strategy, resources and communications, things like distributing resources required to protect the healthcare workforce, meaning uh, your PPE uh, to your workers. Those are just some examples of activities that you can list out in the after action report um, uh, cover. Now, I want to I want to say if you guys are working in incident command, choosing the objectives. Um, 
should not be, uh, you guys already have those objectives in your incident action plan. Uh, what you wanna do is it, as you take a look at those objectives, you're gonna try to line them up with the objectives uh, that are in that, that guidance document that lists the objectives. And the reason why I say that is we wanna maintain that consistency uh, with the reporting process. So we're all kind of looking at gaps within a specific area. Um, the hope is that, you know, uh, we get enough of this, it gives us a big picture of uh, uh, kind of where the gaps are, are uh, in aggregate, not necessarily facility specific stuff. Um, we're gonna use our response activities from 2020. Um, we're not going to uh, add anything in from 2021 into this response. Um, we may need to be able, we may need to do this again in 2021, or we may need to do a functional exercise or a full scale exercise to meet the CMS uh, uh, exercising requirements. And now normally you have to exercise twice a year, exercise your emergency plan twice a year. One of those exercises can be a tabletop. The other one of them is required to be a functional or full scale exercise. But if you have an, an actual activation of your emergency plan, which this definitely qualifies for, that would qualify as a, a, a functional or a full-scale exercise in lieu of that. So for 2020, we're covered. For 2021, we have not got confirmation that the current pandemic will also be uh, available for 2021. Um, my suggestion is to write this as an after-action report that ends in 2020 and, and begin to start another one for 2021. And that way, you're gonna to have to do a complete after action review anyway. Well, I shouldn't say have to, but you absolutely should. You're gonna to have to do some kind of after action report. We know that, but I, you know, I would do this one to make sure I, I'm getting my, uh, you know, survey needs covered for 2020 year. And then I would begin another one because there's every, every month of this, uh, things have changed, you've gotten better, you've progressed, you've ad addressed things as they've come rather than waiting to the end to fix things. All those need to be captured into that after action review. Uh, and we're gonna show you how to, you know, where to put those uh, information into the set of documents. So um, there is a scoring um, system within the, the review. Uh, Jamie, can you uh, switch back to, um, let me show my screen one more time again. All right, whoops. Jamie, are you there? I'll see if I can I can do it here. Bear with me here, guys. Well, I, I, whoops, I apologize about that. Let me go back one page. All right. Well, Jamie, if you hop on, can you swap over to my screen whenever you get a chance? Um, and I'll just say that there's a section and I'll show you what that section looks like. You're gonna score your performance on these objectives. There's gonna be a section here, you're gonna pick uh, a minimum of three objectives uh, from those lists of objectives, and you're gonna review it a minimum of three. Now, uh, that, that's what the, the kind of recommendation is for exercises, but given the, the, the vast nature of this response and how much it's touched in terms of your operations, I don't, I don't want you to feel like you have to limit it to three. Um, maybe you do one uh, that's three objectives for uh, compliance sake, and then you um, have a, 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 a companion document, essentially, that's for your internal review, where you're looking at more in-depth uh, stuff. And, and the reason why I say that is it may, you know, if there's things that you identified that where you've let's say you're looking at your mitigation plan and you say, you know, how well did we do um, in terms of, you know, meeting our own internal mitigation plan? And if you've identified um, gaps in the plan uh, that weren't there and then you've addressed them midstream, those are things that we want to get it added on there. But if you have identified something in your mitigation plan 
that you um, that you went against your own plan, and as a result, there was a negative patient outcome. I'm not certain that that should be uh, captured in your after action review. Don't, uh, it doesn't mean that you should not capture that information. You absolutely should. Um, it's important uh, that we don't make the same mistakes over, especially if they result in negative patient outcomes. But I don't want you to create a document that's going to give somebody a roadmap to sue you if they subpoena this. So I want to make this as compliant as possible. I want to make it as robust as possible, but I also want to make sure that you're not setting yourself up for failure. And Jamie, um, have you come back? Uh, are you able to share my screen? Hey, Summer, can you do me a favor? Can you text or email Jamie and have her hop back on? I apologize, guys. I appreciate I'm here, sorry. It. I was muted and I couldn't, it would not unmute. I'm so oh. sorry. Okay. That's okay. Can, can you swap over to my screen real quick yeah. again? All right. All right. So, so as we look at where we add those um, capabilities and you scroll down just a tad bit and you can see there's this kind of scorecard. And so you're going to put the objective in that you're going to be reviewing what core capability, meaning one of those four core capabilities this falls under. And then you're going to give yourself a, a, a score. Did you perform it with challenges, with some challenges, with major challenges, or were you unable to perform it? That's pretty easy. Seems fairly straightforward to be able to do that. It gives you a definition of how, uh, you know, what would qualify for each category. And then when we get down to the analysis um, of the uh, core capabilities, this is where we're going to talk about strengths, areas of improvement, and an analysis. The analysis is what what um, what AHCA is is creating now. And I'll just give you a kind of a look at what that looks like, and and we're creating kind of standard uh, uh, questions that may or may not have been appropriate for you. But this is an example of kind of some of the, the stuff that we're going to write in there. This doesn't mean that you can't already jump right ahead and start doing this, but this is the part that we've not completed yet. So we'll create, um, you know, sections of the website or, or, or the document that talk about, you know, did you have a written plan? Um, what preparedness efforts did you do um, before um, the pandemic? Um, did you ever exercise it? What are your strengths? What are your areas of improvement? And that's really kind of, it, it doesn't have to be overly blown for compliance sake. In other words, you don't have to kill them with all this information overload, but you do have to identify strengths and areas for improvement. Those are required um, and they're, you know, they're very important obviously for the improvement planning uh, process, but uh, just be cognizant of what information that you're putting in here. We want to make it uh, enough to get um, uh, get you through, uh, you know, compliance without having you to worry about um, putting putting yourself at risk. But I just want to say on this after action review process, I can't stress this enough. Um, and can, here I'm going to go back to the presentation here. Perfect. Thanks. I, I will say that when when we look at these, um, you know, kind of uh, strengths, um, we're going to put, whoops, we're going to put in a, a, a narrative of kind of, you know, what happened and, and what strength we identified in that area of improvement. It should clearly state the problem or gap. But like I said, we don't want it to, um, we don't want to directly tie it back to something that is is going to put, put us at risk. Um, Either through, you know, employee risk or or through um, risk to the residents. And I'll say, if you if you know if you've come into that um, problem or if you've encountered something where you think it it could potentially put you at risk, I I can't state this enough. You really got to find good counsel and somebody to uh, guide you through that process. I, I'm not I'm not an attorney. I don't know what you know where the the dangers lie by putting information into a public document like this, but 
I will, it just gets me very nervous and I don't want you guys to get in trouble for this. So the, the, because the after action reporting is so important um, for how we, uh, how we do things better the next time, I, it's important that we clearly and unequivocally understand as a facility where our gaps are. All, everything should be on the table. Uh, nobody should uh, leave your feelings outside of the room. We're gonna talk about everything. And um, and when we've gotta be honest and frank and we've gotta list everything out and we've gotta fix it all. And that's gotta be your internal message. Um, but for what you show to a regulator does not have to be that um, in depth. Um, when you reference anything in the in this guidance document, what you're going to want to do is you're going to list any of the relevant plans, policies, procedures, regulations, or laws that were in effect at the time. And that goes back to Patty's kind of timeline of the events. Um, and the analysis part um, is kind of what we're going to try to create some language language for, but really, uh, you know, it's 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 going to be really generic and not not at all specific to your facility. And so I, you know, if you've got time, I highly recommend doing that analysis yourself. It, you will, uh, you'll learn a lot and you'll, you'll go, gosh, we, we can do this a lot better. Or we did this in April and gosh, look how much better it, uh, we're doing it now in October or, or whatever. Um, definitely want to have that analysis that's specific to your uh, specific situation, what the gaps were there. Um, in terms of the improvement planning, this is the part where we're going to uh, document this. And on that um, template, I'm not going to show it now, but there is a section on improvement planning. It's kind of like a, a, a checklist. It's very basic. You're going to take the analysis that you've done um, you know, for the after action review and determine corrective action. So what are the things that we could do uh, um, that are gonna make sure that we don't repeat the same mistake um, or uh, try to mitigate uh, the impacts of, of what are, what, whatever that is. And so whatever actions you've determined that you're gonna take to, to correct, you're gonna document that. You're gonna document what person is responsible for overseeing those actions and you're going to document a beginning and a completion date of the um, of the improvement plan. And now, if you've started the improvement planning process, um, generally um, most folks give themselves 60 to 90 day window um, to uh, you know to complete these things. Um, I, I would say, given the current um, state of the pandemic, if there um, if there's if you identified information that you resolved already, go ahead and put the, the completion date that it was resolved. Um, if you've not completed that um, and there's stuff on there that needs to be addressed, I would address it as quickly as possible. I would not wait until uh, you know six months down the road to complete this. I would uh, take action on it as quickly as possible. Now, chances are, if you're looking at events from 2020, and gaps, you may have already filled those gaps. And let's hope so. Um, maybe you had as an objective to uh, obtain a vaccine and, and, and that's come and gone and, and you've got good vaccine coverage and, and uh, things like that. So that would have a completion date to it if you had identified, um, let's say you wanna improve your vaccine acceptance rate, you would uh, identify a completion date for that. Um, those are kind of things that you could put in your improvement planning. Uh, you know, things to do with the mitigation plans are the ones that really concern me. Um, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. And as you guys have uh, questions or going through this, uh, I, I'm happy to um, to give you my expertise in, in how to do an after action report. Um, but I'll just say we'll we'll do a much deeper dive on after action reporting with uh, with council to talk about specific information and i think we're going to do that as a part of the july conference as an educational offering um, but in the interim uh, when the aca uh, document is finalized we'll get that out first things for uh, on the forum we'll cover it on this particular webinar uh, and then um, we'll go from there if you guys have questions in the interim or if you want to start this process don't hesitate to re reach out to me 
and that's why I put the after action report template, uh, the beginning of it on uh, uh, as a handout. And then I, I just, I'll just i just cover the handouts just briefly. The um, CDC guidance for updated healthcare infection prevention, um, the quarantine guidance is attached, as well as the slides for today, the after action template. The uh, attachment as a handout for AFL 2022.6, uh, which was not on it last week, but I've added that here, as well as that um, healthcare priority or um, healthcare capabilities workbook. So that is all I've got for today. Um, I'm gonna try to hop to questions. I know I had still sent, had some questions from last week, and so I'm gonna try to uh, get to those. I, I think we've kind of answered most of those, and I'm just gonna review that before I hop to these questions here. So um, now, what well, question left over um, from last week was, what is the recommended observation period for fully vaccinated resident? who is being remitted back to the facility after being in the hospital for six days. And uh, I think we, we've we covered that. The recommendation is gonna change that that person would not go into the yellow zone if they're fully vaccinated. Like I said, I think CDAPH may add a little bit onto that by saying, unless the, you know, the facility in which they're coming from has, uh, uh, has an outbreak. So there'll, there'll be some slight changes, uh, tweaks to that language. Um, but I think that's going to be hit the AFL pretty soon. So um, let's hop on to other questions here. All right. Sorry, there's a bunch of questions. Get it through. I'm trying. Okay, first question. I'm trying to do the vaccination count for the CDC website. An employee was admitted to us as a patient. She refer, received her first dose as a patient and her second dose as an employee. Should we consider as an employee and patient for each calendar, we should consider both vaccination as an employee? Oh, wow, that's, uh, uh, I, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to say to that one. I, I would assume we're, they're an employee now, we're just gonna do it as, as an employee. But I don't know, that, that was a question from Leslie, Elegot, and, and I'm sorry, Leslie, I, I really have no idea, um, but that's a good one. I will ask, I'll, I'll try to ask Dr. Epson uh, to see if she can give me some guidance on that one, but I would say, I don't know that it matters that much, but uh, I would say, you know, the person's an employee now, let's list them as employee. If I find out differently than that, I'll, I'll definitely address it uh, here on the, on the webinar or on the Wednesday call next week. Great information. Can we reach out to CalReady or any other affiliated um, government agencies to? Oh yes, yes, certainly. If, if well, so the question is, can we reach out to CalReady to obtain clarification on reporting of POC tests? And yes, you can. And that that uh, guidance document that was linked has uh, contact information uh, for CalReady and, and a link to sign up uh, to CalReady. Um, it's, I, you know, those folks are very clear about what the requirement is. It's it's not ambiguous at all. It clearly states in their guidance documents you have to report to them. So it's, um, you know, the only clarification we need is for uh, the folks at CDPH to understand that other departments within their agency are telling us we can't, we must report. So uh, I don't think it's ambiguous. I just think the folks at licensing um, aren't seeing the whole picture. And I don't want you guys to get in trouble based on a half an answer from uh, the licensing folks. Uh, next question, if a visitor can show proof of being vaccinated, hopefully there's more to that question. Uh, nope, that was it. What if a visitor could show proof of being vaccinated? Well, I'm gonna guess um, uh, what proof should you be asking for? Well. I think the honor system is fine. I think you're gonna ask the question and you're gonna yes. check a box. And I I would not get into a thing where I have to see your vaccine card. I'm, I'm, I don't wanna do no. that. And, and if you've seen those vaccine cards, I mean, I have mine. I mean, any anybody with a, a $20 dot matrix printer can counterfeit that thing. So th the card means nothing to me, I, you know, it's, are you saying that you've been vaccinated? Hey, great, if they got a card, that's fine. 
uh, but it's really the honor system and we're 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 giving confirmation that we're confirming their that they have answered that question that and that's really all that that cdph has said you need to do is that correct yeah um, yeah it's part of the screening process so you just it's at part of your screening process when they enter you're going to screen them and ask them what you've been screening them for and then part of it if they're coming in to visit they're gonna it's going to be you know have you been tested in the last two days and and it is more the honor system because there's a lot of other considerations you know um retention of the documentation is the proof the hipaa all of those things so um, it's just going to be part of your screening and make sure you add to your policies that, um, again, what you're doing to meet the, um, be in compliance with the AFL and making sure that's the same um, um, with your district office and, and how they're going to um, view it when they come in to look at your practices. Yeah. Thanks, Patty. That's perfect. The next question, with the AFLs coming so quick, and I think this is more of a more of a, a statement um because you're definitely speaking to the choir here but the, with the afls coming so quick what it what is the time the state expects a facility to adjust some of the changes are not quick adjustments and require operational changes that take a week or so and and you're preaching to the choir I, patty and i can't we can't agree more you know the fact that you guys have had hundreds literally hundreds of regulatory changes in the last year uh it's just it's it's staggering it's about it's it, yeah jason i'm gonna jump in on that one it's about your good faith efforts to be in compliance so if it took you a week to implement you just have to show the state your good faith efforts you know we went through we had to give an in service to all our staff we had to update our policies we had to you know this is the stuff we implemented and here's our good faith efforts so for example on that afl i would i would put the date and my actions attached to that AFL. For your documentation system, for me, if I was out there doing it, I would be printing each of these AFLs and I'd be attaching a sheet for what my good faith efforts were that I did to attain a client um, compliance. And um, so when you're looking back at this for a regulatory standpoint, when you're, the surveyors are in there, you would just go back into this binder and you'd be looking through and you'd be looking at your notes, what you did and when, and for that particular AFL, and you just got to prove your good faith efforts to be in compliance so it's not so much about be, um, being in compliance the date of that afl it's that you okay this afl came out i implemented this we went through and we in service our staff we completed that by wednesday on this date we got our policies done and everyone was educated on the policies we notified you know all the actions you took to be in that compliance and um that's that's what's going to be your um you know that It'll save you when you're um, speaking to your surveys, surveyors. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Yeah, it's great advice. I, I think this applies not just, you know, this that, that's kind of a standard thing, and that's great information to have. So in terms of um, now that we have a new directive um, for admissions uh, who are fully vaccinated, if you have, uh, can we now remove some of our residents from the yellow zone prior to their 14 day quarantine to the green zone if they fit that category? And uh, once 20, the AFL 21-08.2 gets released, I will say yes, you can, provided your local health department um, follows suit with the same quarantine guidance. I, I, I don't know if they will, um, but, the changes that are going to come to the AFL, then definitely that those residents would be able to come out. Um, but we have to wait for the AFL to drop before we can take action on it, and then we we have to clarify with our health department to make sure that they're going to be okay with that. So we are currently in once weekly testing due to county positivity rates uh, below 10%. Are there any concerns with using a POC test for staff who are not able to make it to our weekly PCR testing event? And um, I'll just say that my my understanding of the POC tests to be able to be used um, in the surveillance um, setting or screening setting would be only if you were using that point of care device twice a week. Um, if you're just doing once a week testing, um, I don't believe that CDPH wants you using a point of care test um, for that staff member if you're doing it only once a week. So uh, I, I would say, you know, you know you're gonna have to uh, work around that and try to get that, that person a PCR test. 
Um, and I just heard that information this morning um, that was clarified by Dr. Epson that we want that they want folks um, doing if they're going to do the point of care test as a part of their screening that can't be any less than twice a week. So uh, just so you know. Last question, is there any changes on travel quarantine time for LA County regarding non-essential travel for fully vaccinated persons? And I'll just, um, I'll just refer you back to the slide where we talked about the CDC guidance. Um, the LA County uh, is gonna follow, you know, CDPH has said that you're, you're gonna have to follow that travel guidance from CDC. I assume LA County is gonna be the exact same. They may add uh, something more stringent than that, but definitely review those travel restrictions um, because there's gonna be folks that travel and they're gonna have to quarantine when they come back. So that's all we've got. We ended right at two o'clock. It's like I planned it, holy cow. I wanna say thank you to, um, uh, to Patty, she, immensely helpful uh, in language. And we will, we will definitely message out when we're gonna have that staffing audit. We're gonna have a webinar next uh, Friday and I will be gone the following week and, and Patty is going to, um, we're gonna try to have, on the week that I take vacation, I'm, I'm gonna try to have Patty uh, uh, do that staffing audit during the same time. So if that turns out, we'll, we'll definitely message that out to folks. Um, go ahead and get registered for, um, for the webinars now when you see the registration date get set up and uh, we should be all set. So hopefully you guys have a great weekend. Patty, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Summer. Appreciate you guys. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.